Welcome to the Wingman Show. My name is Drew Brown, and my wingman, my man, the number one guy I know, Dr. Paul Thompson. What's up, brother? Welcome to the Wingman Show. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Rumble, you two badass jet pilots, rumble. Welcome to the Wingman Show. My name is Commander Drew Brown. My wingman, the guy who watches my six, my friend, Dr. Paul Thompson. Hello, Brother Paul. How are you today? Hello, Mr. Drew. I'm doing fine. Glad to see you. This is going to be a nice show. It's a nice day. Any day you wake up is a nice day, and I'm ready to get started. Every day we wake up is a nice day. So we're going to start it off with a quote. And Dr. Paul, you know, this is our 150th show, and I'd like to congratulate you and myself on doing this. I'm really proud of us. So for the 150th show, I have my favorite quote that somebody once said, and I thought it was the wrong person, so I never said it. But here's the quote. Early to bed, early to rise, work all day and advertise. I used to tell my kids that every day. Early to bed, early to rise, work all day and advertise. And who said that was Ted Turner. And I'm so happy that I found out it was Ted and not somebody else. But I used to write that to my kids all the time, Dr. Paul. That's the way to succeed. Early to bed, early to rise, work all day and advertise. What do you think, Doc? I agree. You know, you got to get started. The early, earlier the better. Uh, sometimes, I haven't done it for a while. Sometimes I folks would get up at 4.30, 4 in the morning and start. There are some people who don't need that much sleep and uh, have pretty good health. Generally, it's just the opposite. But there are some people that can go on like minimal sleep and they work all the time. Of course, you got to you got to balance that out. Don't uh, don't don't worry yourself out to the point where you just just drop dead all of a sudden from lack of care. So I think it's individual. But the more time you put into something, the more reps you get, the better you'll get. So everything we do. All right, Dr. Paul, the name of this show is how to go to medical school for free. Guess what? Go to the Bronx. My son, the doctor, Dr. Drew Brown the fourth, he paid for his own medical school. And him and I had a little riff about the payment of medical school. And I'm telling you this only because in the end, he wound up paying for it. And he told me something that I'll never forget. He said, Dad, that's the best thing I ever did was pay for my own med school. And I truly believe it. But now, if you want to go to med school, and you have the grades, go to the Bronx. Albert Einstein College is tuition-free medical school. And that's because Dr. Gottlieb, this wonderful lady, donated a billion dollars, Paul. What about that? A billion dollars with a B. A billion dollars to the Bronx Medical School called Albert Einstein. No more tuition for the students, Dr. Paul. That is, uh, that's great. That's great. Isn't there some other school in New York that's doing that too? Yes, but that's in Manhattan. And Manhattan. I don't know the name of it. But when we were reading the article, we saw that Bronx is the poorest borough in New York City out of the five boroughs. Manhattan is the richest. And all those schools that get money, a lot of money, the medical schools are all in Manhattan. This is the first time a school in the Bronx. And I think it's the largest donation ever to a medical school. Dr. Paul. I think you're right. I think you're right. She started this off in 1968. She started working at the Albert Einstein School, and she actually got her master's, and then she got her doctorate at Columbia. And so she's had a long, long relationship with Albert Einstein School. And her husband was David Gottlieb. And you know how we got all this money, Paul? He Tell was me. friends. He was friends with Warren Buffett, and back when Warren Buffett started, he was an investor, and so right. that's how he made all his money. And then he became a financial guru and had a investment firm in Manhattan. And when he died, he left his wife, unbeknownst to her, a whole bunch of money, and that's how she gave that billion. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, she didn't even know about that, which is amazing. Obviously, they were they were doing better than pretty good. 
But uh, Berkshire Hathaway, people don't know, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, had said Berkshire Hathaway. I think he started, I think it started like 1961 or two. So it's like 62 years old. But you know how much, uh, uh, I guess, a share of Berkshire Hathaway cost in 1962? Tell me. I, I look. I think it's like it was around seven dollars, which is probably a lot of money if you think about it at the time. But it's it's like seven dollars a share, seven dollars and five cents. So let's make believe David got Gottman. He actually uh, he bought a thousand shares at seven dollars. Okay, well that's a lot or today. Uh, I think a share today is like six. six uh, yesterday it was like six hundred and forty two thousand dollars per share. <laughs> it average like about three hundred thousand share, but it's, it's like it was like six. I've said I've seen six eighty six and six forty six. Let's say over six hundred thousand dollars a share. So if you, you know, I was going to tell you five thousand dollars a share because a long, 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 long time ago, when I was investing, I wanted to buy a share of Berkshire Hathaway, and back then you couldn't split shares, but it was five thousand dollars for one share. Wow. That is incredible, Dr. Paul. Wow, yeah, 600, 686 a share. You know, he buys all kinds of stuff, you know, one of the powers of investing. But that's, uh, you know, a guy that, you know, did really well. His stuff has just gone up and up and up and up, you know, forever. Well, maybe my Apple stock will do that, you think? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> that's what it's been doing. But what I really like about this, Paul, no kidding, is that you don't, have to be rich now to go to medical school. All you have to do is study, bust your ass in school, get good grades, get a good MCAT, and you can go to medical school for free. And I didn't tell you this, but back in the day, I wanted to be a rapper. Not really, but I had a name for a, ma a rapper when Drew was going to medical school. And my name, my rapper name would have been MC At. MC At, That's which general. stands for MCAT. That's the okay. test you got to take to get into medical school. Okay. A little, a little corny, but uh, we'll accept it today. Very corny. Well, guess what? Other good news we have. You know Shaquille O'Neal. He is an amazing dude. I've always thought he was amazing. And on the basketball court, he was tenacious. There was nobody ever like Shaq. But there was this kid who's sixteen years old. He weighs three hundred and eighty pounds. He's six foot five. And he has a 23-foot shoe. And what happened was the only size him and his mom could ever get were 22, and his feet started hurting, so he doesn't wear shoes anymore. Anyway, the community got around together and did a GoFundMe and got $12,000 to get him some shoes. But Dr. Paul, did you hear that Shaq read that? And he did something, didn't he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> He sent him a set of a bunch of shoes. Uh, and I think Shaq's foot is not, I don't think his foot is as big, but he understood you know, the challenges he has getting something on his feet. Uh, he had that same problem when he was a teenager and his parents struggled to find, you know, find clothes to fit him, obviously. You know, you're not going to get that at the big, you know, his stuff at the big and tall shop. That's not going, that's not going to cut it. So, That's true. Uh, I never thought about that. He's too big and too tall. He's too big and too tall. He's just he's just big. You realize Yao Ming is a lot bigger, that, but I don't want to get off track too much. No, he, he is. He is. But did you know, Shaq gave him not only 20 pairs of sneakers, Paul, but he gave him clothes. And this is not the first time Shaq has done that. There's some other teenagers who had big feet. And actually, there was one that his foot was even bigger than 23, and they for some reason, they're not saying what size it is. Shaq and Puma got together, and they came up with a shoe for that young man. Shaq is on every commercial and every basketball show you can see. So he's making a lot of money. But what I love is that he's giving it back and always has. And he has. that's why he's such a joyful person, Paul. Yeah, I saw recently he donated. No, he, didn't, he, bought, he bought two SUVs for a family. That had a lot of uh, had a lot of kids and had some challenges, and I don't know what how they got in touch with him, but there's a picture of him. He's in a Mercedes dealership. He buys him an SUV and he thinks, you know, you know, he probably needs two of them, so he gets them yeah. too. That's true. Well, you know, it just goes to show, Doctor Paul, the more you give, the more you get back, and that is the truth. And I think every time Shaq does something good, he gets another commercial. All right. 
All right. Dr. Paul, you see them badass jets we got behind us? I do. I have an A-1 Sky Raider, which is an older prop plane. And Dr. Paul and I both flew T-28s. And it was that type of reciprocal engine that we flew. It was a big, heavy, loud prop plane. And what Paul has behind him is a super bad A-4 Skyhawk. And Dr. Paul and I both flew those in training. Tell me about them, Paul. Yeah, I, I like uh, I like the A4. I like T2. I really really like the A4. A lot of power, very responsive, extremely maneuverable, and uh, for me it was comfortable. If you were over a certain size, though, it it was tight. I think in terms of being comfort, I think I was probably about almost the max size for it to be tight. Because even when the uh, canopy came down, yeah, it cleared my shoulders good, but not like a whole, not by a whole lot. And I had a really good buddy of mine that was. Uh, significantly larger, maybe a little shorter, but more massive in the upper body. And he could barely fit in. He could barely fit in that thing. A lot of the planes were made, I think, early on for people who are smaller in stature. If you look at the Mercury astronauts, the original astronaut, none of those are what I would call big people. They're not they're not big guys. No. If you're like about five foot eight or so, eight, five foot eight, five foot nine with a with a, a frame to match that. I think that's who it was made for primarily. But, yeah, so uh, how do you think I felt at six five? You know how I flew that eight four, Dr. Paul? You were probably you were probably at the at the limit. You oh, probably... I definitely was at the limit and I would have lost my legs if I had a jet. And they let me know that. I think I even had to sign a waiver saying that. Yeah. But the way I flew it is, you know, most people with long legs, they push the pedals all the way up, right? Yeah, I could not fly like that because my shins couldn't get under the, the dashboard. So what I did is I brought the pedals all the way forward, and I flew with my knees up like that. And that's the only way I could fly the A4. But it would do 720 degrees twice around in one second. That was a badass jet plane. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening to The Wingman Show. We truly do appreciate it. Anybody on YouTube, why don't you hit that subscribe button? Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio. We want to thank you so much. Watch our TikTok and our Instagram. And we have a website that gives a newsletter. Our website is wingmanshow.com. That's wingmanshow.com is our website. And on that website, we have a newsletter, and this week's newsletter is going to be great. The Ultimate Guide on How to Apply to Medical School. Some really good, useful information on that newsletter. And we also have a frequent flow line. And that means you can ask Dr. Paul and Commander Drew a question. And we do have a question this week. And it comes from a man in Lincoln, Nebraska, 44-year-old gentleman, and he says, my sister wants a third child, but her husband doesn't. They can afford it. What are our thoughts on it? Dr. Paul, you want to start off with that one? Yeah, well, I think uh, you need to have a meeting. You need to have a meeting of the minds. That seems to be kind of unusual, the brothers talking about the sister, but I guess you get advice where you ever can get it. But they need to have a, a meeting of the minds. So they've got two. they've got two children. She wants a third. He doesn't want any. I guess it maybe it depends on the uh, on the ages of the other kids, what he's got planned, uh, what else is going on, what are you know what are the motivations? What are the motivations for having a third child? What are the motivations for not wanting a child? So it sounds like they've got to work out you know whatever's going on between them. I assume I assume they're getting on getting along okay, or perhaps not. I, I just put that as a question. I think that we need a lot more information, Dr. Paul, to actually give a very good answer to this person. But what I think is, number one, you should mind your own business. And I don't mean that mean, but it's very, very bad to get into people's businesses like that. The other thing I want to say is that if two people don't want a child, I don't think it's good to have one. And it was the same thing like Taryn, my daughter, was highly recruited by all these colleges all over the country to play basketball. And somebody very wise told me, Dr. Paul, don't pick her school for her. And the reason not to is because as soon as something goes bad, they're going to blame you. Well, if you have a child and 
both parents didn't want it. Whenever, whenever a problem happens, I don't want them to blame each other saying, I told you you shouldn't have a kid. I told you we should have a kid. So that's what I think. But I think you need to be very careful talking to your sister and not alienate yourself from their family. That's what I think, Dr. Paul. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. That it's brings good. us to a wingman PSA from the 11 facts in life. This is under fact number six that says good will overcome evil. Avoid these eight deadly sins. We are on the sin of gluttony. Gluttony. Eat right. Drink water, exercise, and get help if needed. Very important, that last part. Eat right, exercise, drink water. But if you need help and you're obese, please seek help. There is help out there. Gluttony, Paul, that, that goes right along with greed. But I have to say this. Obesity is a major problem in America, Dr. Paul. A major problem. But... I know that this obesity problem has a lot to do with the mind, and it is a medical disease. Unlike alcohol and drugs, you can live without alcohol and drugs, but you can't live without food. So anybody, if you have an eating problem, and sugar is a drug, it'll make you come back. And I've talked about Dr. Paul's delicious cake he bought for a party I once had. I was, I was scrounging all over looking for an extra piece of that cake. Sugar is like crack, Dr. Paul. But gluttony, eat right, exercise, drink water, and ask for help. You agree, Dr. P? Yeah, 100%. And I guess one of the things that complicates, you know, nutrition for a lot of people, a lot of, you can be obese and malnourished at the same time, which seems as an oxymoron. It's crazy. But there are a lot of people who live what they call food deserts, and they really don't have a lot of selection of fruits and vegetables. These little stores, bodegas, and some places, they're just selling processed stuff. There's not a piece of fruit to be found. So it's really, really tough. Lots of lots of soft drinks and sodas, which is basically liquid sugar. So a lot of times if you don't have, have enough uh, funds, you really can't even buy healthy food. And if you live in certain areas, there's no healthy food to be found. So that complicates things, too. There's, a, there's an economic Things. Can you tell me why raw pistachios cost more than roasted and salted pistachios when you have to process that pistachio and add a substance to its salt? So that should actually cost more than raw pistachios. But it's not because they know I'll pay to not eat salt. That's right. That's right. You'll pay for it. And you can afford it. And also with the water, now I have stopped drinking sodas long, long time ago. I used to be a Diet Coke fanatic, but I stopped drinking sodas a long time ago. And what I do now, I have a half gallon bottle of water and I won't drink any of my seltzers. I drink seltzer instead of soda now. Mm -hmm. I won't drink any seltzer until that half gallon is gone. And that's how I keep my water. It's very important to keep water in your body. Your body's 80 percent water, isn't it, right. Paul? Right. It is. You know, that's important to do. You know, drink, drink your water and not all that junk. I haven't. You know, you talk about uh, sodas. I, you know, I grew up grew up with sodas, especially in the summertime. And I remember when, uh, well, one of them was. I remember when Mountain Dew was brand new. Mm. It was brand new, and it was it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on a hot, you know, especially especially with hot or cold, it was fantastic. Nobody knew, you know, if this was good. I would chug along as much of that stuff as you could get. I could knock out a six pack by myself. But uh, a lot of stuff was uh, tasted, I, th I think it actually tasted better. But there's so many things we're putting in our bodies as, as youngsters. Or looking at that, it really weren't good and probably contributed to some difficulties we're having now in old age. But boy, it tastes good. Yeah, and Mountain Dew is jam-packed with caffeine and sugar, and that's why you liked it so much. Yeah. You were on great. a Mountain Dew high. Yeah, I actually like Seven Up back in the day. I used to drink Seven Up, but Mountain Dew—that's a—that's a real killer right there. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to start eating healthy, the best thing you can do is start off a little bit at a time. Start off with stop sodas, just no more sodas. Just drink water. Do that for a little while. But you ever seen fat vegan? Because I have, and that's because they eat potatoes, and they say it grows from the earth. 
yet they're eating all these carbohydrates, and that's not good. I think everybody can eat a good diet. And what I found is be moderate. You can have a little this, a little that. I'm 92, 93% a good eater, Dr. Paul. I agree. Good. All right, the gouge. What is the gouge? Gouge is a Navy word, and it's legal insider information, or as I say, shit you need to know. How about this gouge here? Women, they don't need as much exercise as men do, and they get the same heart healthy results. So any women that can hear our voice right here, they're saying you don't have to exercise as hard as a man to get the same results. They said that five hours of a man working out is equal to two and a half hours of a woman working out. They said that if you lift weights three times a week, they said a woman only has to do it one time a week. Tell me about this disparity in male and female exercises, Doctor P. Yeah, I'd, I'd never, I've never heard that before. But that's, uh, I guess, that's good news if you're if, if you're a woman. But for anybody, you know, that's it's relevant. But you got to get out and do something. Basically, if you get out and do something, if women get out and do things that are vigorous. They get maybe a little more cardio benefit in a shorter period of time. You know, it's good. You know, hooray for you. But everybody should be out walking and out moving. 100%. And when I was talking about weightlifting and exercising, that's good for heart health. That doesn't mean you lose as much fat or calories and all that. It means your heart, it's heart health, your cardio. And I think that that's amazing. And talking about women, Dr. Paul, what do you think the fastest growing high school sport for girls are? I was, gonna, I was, I would, I would think uh, soccer. Soccer. So would I. I would have answered that. The answer is wrestling. <laughs> Girls are now wrestling and they love it. They had no schools back in 2020. And right now there's 180 high schools competing in women's wrestling. And they just had a state tournament in Pennsylvania. What do you think is causing these girls who want to get on the mat? I, you know, I don't know. It's maybe more televised uh, MMA, mixed martial arts events, other things. Maybe uh, women are wrestling. I don't watch the wrestling like I used to, you know, 30 years, 40 years ago. But, uh, you know, in the WWF, WWE, they've got women wrestlers. I remember seeing, uh, oh, wrestlers, they were, it was a long time ago. They were, they called themselves the housewives. And they, there's there's two women. They dress up in uh, like frumpy nightgowns and have their hair in rollers, and they're wrestling. It was weird. I saw it like once or twice. I think it was like on black and white TV, but it existed. And then there was a woman. Uh, she was called the fabulous Moolah or something. Yes, she's a big time wrestler. And, you know, I don't I don't think this. You know, you ask. You know, what what's making them do that? Nobody even remembers this stuff. But it, it existed, you know. Sometimes they'd have they'd have men and these women would pick up men and women over, hold them, bench press them over their heads, and, and uh, easily, and throw them to the campus. There's some strong people out there. What if I told you this story, Doctor Paul? I've been blessed to been able to meet a whole bunch of people, especially people I've really admired. One was George Clinton from Parliament Funkadelic. I'll never forget that. But another, when Drew and I and Taryn used to watch wrestling back in the day with Junkyard Dog and all those guys. There was a woman called Miss Jones, and she actually was the partner of a wrestler called The Cat. And I thought Miss Jones was the most gorgeous, beautiful, best-shaped girl I've ever seen. And I would watch wrestling just to watch her. All right, Dr. Paul? Okay. Well, guess what? One day, my daughter, Taryn, says, hey, you want to go to lunch? I said, sure. I said, I'm going to bring a friend. Guess who she brings? Who? Miss Jones. <laughs> really? <laughs> Where did you I know her from? I cannot believe it. Taryn and Carmel are friends. And that's her real name, Carmel. She's a really? beautiful, wonderful girl. And I've known her for so long now, over 20 years, I believe. And it is the biggest trip in my life that she used to be Miss Jones. I just thought that story was really cool. Well, that's 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 good. I have to see a picture. Have I seen Miss Jones and the cat? That's a new one to me. Yes. 
Well, she was my little specialized. She was my own private treasure. Miss, okay. I, and you know what? For YouTubers, I'll find a picture of the cat and of Miss Jones Carmel, and I'll put them up there. Okay. All right, you know the name of this show is called The Wingman Show, and that's because every week we have somebody real special, somebody who deserves that wingman title. And Dr. Paul is going to give us our wingman this week. Yeah, our wingman this week, we kind of had a tease to him, but our wingman is a, a very distinguished person. His name is Dr. Philip Ozua. Dr. Philip Ozua. And Dr. Philip Ozua is... Uh, integral to the story about the billion dollar donation to the uh, Albert Einstein Medical College. Dr. Philip Azula is a uh, basically a pediatrician by training. He did his training in uh, Abidjan, uh, Nigeria, came to the U.S., has multiple degrees, uh, but yeah, I guess a, a struggling student initially, like everyone else. But he went to uh, University of uh, Nebraska at Lincoln and also uh, USC, University of Southern California, getting uh, various degrees. So again, you know, he uh, has done a lot. He came uh, as a clinician to uh, Albert Einstein College. He got his training there, uh, didn't go on the faculty, graduated, and he ended up being uh, oh, I say, a pediatrician in the uh, Bronx, in the South Bronx. Didn't come with a lot of money. He didn't know anybody in New York and just worked years and years and years. And later on, he became part of the faculty of uh, Albert Einstein. But the thing about him is that he is kind of, he's directly related to uh, the Dr. Ruth uh, Gottesman that we talked about. And that they she was teaching there for a long time. He was practicing there. They developed a, a friendship. And then COVID struck. Mm. COVID struck, and uh, she, I guess she got in touch with him, but realized that you know she was a little sick, and her husband was very sick. Her husband is, was David, David uh, Gottsman. So this Dr. Azua sent an ambulance to their home. I guess they lived up in Rye, New York. I think I was up there one time. Up in Rye, New York, a little ways away. They uh, brought him to the hospital, got him some treatment. I guess they went home. And then for the next three weeks, Dr. Uh, Azua personally went up to gave him basically house calls and tended to them. And went in the full protective gear. When uh, COVID started, nobody knew what it was or how contagious. Well, he knew it was contagious. So he's there in I called the beekeeper suit. And he administered them for, he tended to them for three weeks. And they developed a bond. Long story short, I guess they re they recovered to some extent. And Dr. Azua and Dr. Gottsman were doing things together. But one thing that got me was on a, a trip. They were both on a, a trip to Florida for some medical convention. And uh, he was escorting her, and she almost tripped. And he kind of put his hand out to help her. And she said, no, no, I'll help myself. And basically... Uh, joked and said, well, this is kind of like the lion and the mouse. You're the lion, I'm the mouse. But uh, since you tried to help me, and you tried to help me so much, maybe this little mouse can uh, help you one day. Wow. Long story, long story short, you know, her husband passes away. He's older. She finds out she has all this money. And the husband's instruction was, only instruction was, do it with the money, do what you think is best. And she thought the best thing I could do is donate it to the hospital, Albert Einstein Hospital. So she donates the billion dollars and basically tells Dr. Ozua, well, maybe the little mouse has actually helped you. But with the little mouse has helped a lot of people. But it's the relationship, the relationship between Philip Ozua and Dr. Gottsman that I'd say helped make it all possible. If he wasn't there, would she still do it? Uh, you know, we could say probably, maybe. There's so many things you could do with a billion dollars. But because of that relationship, it's paying for the education for a large pool of doctors who can come out of a fine institution without tremendous medical debt. 
So we're kind yeah, of doing that. To it's about a two hundred thousand dollar deal to go to medical school on the cheap side. Yeah, I bet it's more than that. I bet it, that sounds like a conservative figure. Yeah, and you know she did say something that was very important. She wants all of this money to go into tuitions, all of the money to go into tuitions. And you realize financially, if you put a billion dollars in a couple of funds, you can make seven, eight, nine percent from that every year. So that's 70, 80 or 90 million dollars a year for tuition. And you never have to use that billion. That's right. That's right. It can keep growing. It'll, it'll be more than that. So it's a it's a win win for everybody. She feels good. And she probably has a few dollars left over. So uh, <laughs> that's that's about fifteen hundred shares of uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock. Give you about a billion dollars, <laughs> fifteen or sixteen hundred shares, something like that. Well, what she did is she made it affordable for anybody now to be a doctor, and you can't use the excuse I can't afford it anymore. Yep. Doctor Paul, you and all our listeners, whatever you guys think is beautiful, whatever you guys, whatever makes you happy. And dear God, whatever you think is important, may you have that today and forever. I pray for peace, Dr. Paul. Yeah, I pray for peace, too. And we appreciate all those for listening, liking, sharing our message. Yes, if you're watching YouTube, please give us a thumbs up, a like. It helps out a lot with the algorithm. And hit the notification bell so you'll get a notice every time we come out with a new episode. We appreciate you very much. And every day is a good day. And if it's not that way starting out, try to end up with a positive feeling. Thank you once again, Dr. Paul Thompson, my friend. Thank you for your love, your time. And that's something that we won't ever get back. I want to thank all the listeners, too. Thank you so much for doing the show, Dr. Paul. We're jamming. Well, thank you, Mr. Drew, for inviting me on. Always good to talk to you. And ladies and gentlemen, Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast or any of the podcasts. If you're looking at YouTube, uh, they say smash the like button. Don't smash it. Just press it gently and refer to use as a link to all your friends. You can also look at us on our website, wingmenshow.com, W-I-N-G-M-E-N, show, S-H-O-W.com, all together, wingmenshow.com. And we hope to see you in the future. Thanks again, Mr. Drew. Oh, you're welcome. And we're still floating like butterflies and stinging like bees. Rumble, you badass jet pilots, rumble. May there be peace on earth and goodwill towards all men and women.